Yeah. Good. Yeah. So, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the another lecture series organized by the Seminar Committee, Department of History, University of Delhi. So, today with us we have Professor Sujandra Ghosh, who teaches Indian History in the Department of History, University of Hyderabad. She has previously taught in the Department of Ancient Indian History and Culture, University of Calcutta. Her research focuses on ancient Indian numis numismatics, epigraphy, and transregional trade and religious practices across the Indian Ocean Zone. She has also written about political and cultural histories of Northwestern India. Professor Ghosh has written, has authored two books on the larger themes of connected histories, exploring connectivity, Southeastern Bengal and beyond 2015, and from Marxist to the Indus, a political and cultural studies, 300 BC to 100 BC, 2017, besides having contributed numerous research articles. She is also a co-editor of four substantial volumes and serves as an area editor of the Encyclopedia of Ancient India, uh, Ancient, uh, Ancient History, Asia and Africa, published by the Wiley Blackwell. More recently, Professor Ghosh has been exploring histories of everyday life and has made significant forays into the world of ancient Indian sculpture to understand quotidian practices that may not find a place in the written records. We are delighted that she will be sharing some of her recent works with us today. So we also have Professor Seema Baba Ma'am here to chair the session. Uh, over to you, Ma'am. Uh, thank you, Professor Ghosh, for accepting our invitation to speak on this very important subject of social history, which really is something that we really need to explore. And uh, since you'll be also speaking on social history of art to an extent, uh, which is something that I is my subject, I'm really looking forward to that. And, and sure, our students and everybody who's going to be listening to this lecture is going to really uh, profit from what you're going to be saying, because uh, the range of evidence that one can uh, use in order to talk about Kutodian practices and, uh, could, uh, you know, uh, the kind of everyday lives that are depicted beyond the iconic uh, is very, very interesting and important. And over to you, Professor Ghosh. Thank you so much for the generous introduction, Ashu. And uh, thank you very much, Professor Bawa, I, if I may call you Seema, the head of the history department. And of course, Professor Azuddin Akil and my friend, Professor Parul Pandyadhar, so, um, for organizing this talk. And I'm so glad and delighted to be here today, uh, speaking in this forum of the Department of History. And I thank all of you and also the students who are the other colleagues of the department from this university and from other places and the students who will be listening to this talk. Uh, in the beginning, I should like to uh, um, inform that uh, in this talk, I would like to uh, foreground uh, two things. One is to expand the nature of archives, because when we are working on pre-modern period, we know that we are limited by our sources and we do not have any archives per se in the traditional sense of the term. But here, uh, there was this feeling that one can have a kind of a um, expansion of the archive if we think a little differently. And I must thank my friend, uh, Professor Radhika Session, who actually uh, instigated me uh, to this thought and uh, said that one can work on this. And therefore, because I have written on this for a volume which she is going to publish. Uh, now, may I share my screen? Uh, so I will begin with a little bit of historiographical note on the notion of everyday, and then I will come to my main uh, theme. So uh, to begin with, when we look at archives, a simple dictionary meaning of archives is a collection of historical documents or records providing information about a place, institution, or group of people. It is the careful and systematic storage of documentation of papers, documents by an institution or body 
and those papers also relate to institutions. An archive is mostly but not solely associated with the state authority and is part of a state organ. Archival documents are mostly unpublished papers until these are used by some authors. How much of the documents will be accessible to public rests on the policy of classified and declassified documents, mostly de decided by the state authority. These collections of historical documents are traditionally preserved in paper. But one has also to remember that archives are not transparent window through which we can view societies remote from us in time. Archival materials shape as well as color our understanding of the past. Here, I would like to explore the practice of every day in early India from a set of historical documents, which are penned not on paper, but are sculpted in stone and clay. They're not so-called classified or declassified documents, but some may remain in the reserve collection of the museum and some may be available, available for display to public eyes. Put differently, I would like to look at the visual archive to fathom the ways how people live their lives in early India. The archive is fragmentary because we don't get a total picture. But anyway, with this fragmentary evidence, we can make a headway and can imagine a little bit. The study of the quotidian has a long lineage in the context of Europe, but it did not take off as an essential aspect of social history in the Indian context, though it is a valid area of inquiry. An exercise to comprehend everyday life in historical terms requires an interdisciplinary approach. Gordon W. Hughes once lamented the absence of daily life component in civilizational analysis. He showed how historians are preoccupied with grand achievements, such as philosophical systems, the finers, relation between states, and the dramatic march of great events. But uh, topics like houses, clothing, or costume, cooking, or cuisine, funerals, and feasts are hardly represented in historical writings. We know that the way everyday life is being viewed nowadays is beyond these things also. Olville Guldner points out that the negative conception of daily life is reflected in writings as early as of Plato, who locates everyday life as, if I quote, pursuit of things of lesser value, of wealth, of fame, of ordinary appetites, and earthy loves, rather than manifesting more reflective and rational concerns. In the sociological studies too, the practitioners of macro structure relegated the study of everyday life to marginalia and the followers of the micro sociological tradition, which emerged as reaction to it, took the position that every day is a paramount reality, something taken for granted and unalterable by individuals. In response to both, there is a third approach of sociologists who take the position that although everyday life can display routinized, static, and unreflexive characteristics, it is also capable of a surprising dynamism and moments of penetrating insight and boundless creativity. The, today, I actually want to explore this aspect of everyday life, which, is, which has a kind of a dynamism when we look at the sculptures and it is a matter of boundless creativity. In the historical context, the idea of writing the history of the everyday life caught the imagination of historians and serious academic discussions on everyday life took off from the beginning of the first half of the 12th, 20th century. A large body of historical writing has made everyday life, the experiences, actions, and habits of the ordinary people, a legitimate object of historical inquiry. Thus, in the European studies, we have expressions like La vie quotidienne, la vida privada, and alter geschicht, all used for explaining daily life. There are five volumes of a, a history of private life, edited by Philip Corey and George Duby, which grow out of the Annal school's attempt at capturing total history. It is, of course, true that there are distinct nuances in the meanings of daily life and private life. Fernand Brodel took the idea of everyday life further. For him, every day is a constituent of the long durée. He shows how the processes of life living 
every day generates durable structures of whatever we are intrigued by. Structures of interpersonal and intergroup relationships like structures of domination and subjugation or structures of cultural practices. The structure pervades the society at all its level and characterizes ways of being and behaving which are perpetuated through endless ages. So Brothel said that even the festivals which are not happening every day, but has a routine, has a calendar, so that could be brought into the purview of every day because it has a kind of a structure. So he defined everyday life as consisting of the little things that one hardly notices in time and space to put differently to understand the everydayness. Attention to small components is imperative. Everyday life was understood by him as a sphere of routine as opposed to economic and political life, the sphere of change. Forms of behavior and social interaction in the Middle Ages in Europe was also discussed by J. Huizinga in his book, The Waning of the Middle Ages, where a detailed picture of everyday life in the 15th century Europe was portrayed. His work is indeed a powerful representation of the emotions that entail the everyday life of the people. It is a part of social history which explores the values, feelings, and belief of the people and gave them a degree of agency whether in the circumstances of the everyday or the extraordinary. It needs to be reiterated that the study on everyday life, though a component of the history of society, is not a residual category. In fact, social reality was grounded in the quotidian, which of course evolved with the passage of time, albeit very slowly. In the Indian context, we cannot forget the words of Janine Aguirre and also um, Professor Basham, who included a chapter on every day in his book, Wonder That Was India. But the discussions on the idea of a good life eluded most of the works on social history. That every day was not boring, routine, always could be understood from the narrative's cultural archive, which embellished the monasteries in early India, just as the pursuit of leisure of the urban elite population becomes visible through a set of these cultures. There are also others in the archive that are evocative of the life of an ordinary common man, uh, and also the life of an elite, because the elites are also represented in various ways uh, through the various, uh, through the sculptures. Uh, I now would like to speak that I have chosen two sites. One is Sankol at, on the, uh, at one end of the spectrum, an early historic Buddhist site from North India near Chandigarh, uh, which is, and the second is the port site of, and then I come to Bengal, and which is a port site, riverine port site called Chandrakitugar. And then I move into the early medieval in general, and there I focus on the monastic sites, uh, three monastic sites actually, Paharpur uh, from Bengal, Paharpur, Jagjivanpur, and Mainamati. Uh, now, uh, I'd like to uh, mention before we begin uh, the, the acknowledgement parts, which generally comes in the last, but since I have drawn from this, and I'm, I must confess that with my relocation, uh, some uh, very interesting sculptures, materials, uh, which is in my CD, I could not show you today, I wouldn't be able to show you because uh, it's not with me, but I have mentioned them in the text. So these are the texts that I have used and uh, for the kind of, for the um, early medieval monastic sites, that was my personal visit with different colleagues and some of the photographs are my photographs and some taken by Rajit Shanna. Now, uh, <clears throat> let me come in directly to the topic of today's discussion. Uh, we can see that the nature, uh, we were talking about three uh, different kinds of sites. But we can see that the nature of the sites is different, but their commonality lies in the fact that the recovered visual repertoire enables us to really have a glimpse of the everyday in the early India. The idea of narrating the history of everyday pursuit of man from the visual archive are used for broadening the meanings of archives. Now, this is Sangol, you can see the location. It is a lesser known site in the art historical landscape of early India. Sangol is basically famous for its Buddhist monastic complex. It lies in Fatehgarh uh, Sahib um, district of Punjab state, this site locally known as Uchpind, that is high village. 
the ancient name was of Sangol was Sanghapura, from which the present name is derived. A variety of coins, seals, and sealings of the Kushana rulers bearing inscriptions in Karoshti and Brahmi scripts have been discovered at this site in large numbers. This would clearly indicate that Shangol was a prosperous town during then an urban, that means an urban center during the Kushana period. Though it has a long history of occupation, this site attained its height during the reign of the Kushanas, but it was also active during the time of the Speaker Parthians or the Indo Parthians. It is famous for its association with Buddhism. You can see uh, one of the stupas. There was a stupa and a monastery. Uh, we'll come to that later on. Uh, and interestingly, uh, the, the, what struck me uh, when I was thinking of archive, because uh, why I chose this site, because this site offers us a unique experience of re recovering a stupa railing from a large pit. Uh, interestingly, the railing was dismantled. It was nicely packed and buried by the inhabitants of the site as they considered it precious. So it was, there was a pit and from that pit, it was recovered. They were carved on mottled red stone of Mathura uh, that we find of, uh, in Mathura. Uh, these sculptures were part of the low square. This is just to give you an idea of how it, uh, it worked. Uh, were part of low square railing consisting of upright, uprights, crossbars, and coping stones. Thus, there were 58 upright pillars, seven double-sided pillars proper, four corner pillars, 35 crossbars, and 13 coping stones. So there was a kind of a quantification that was possible. As a general rule, we find female figures often identified with uh, Shalavanjika uh, on the obverse side of the pillars. The inner side is decorated by lotus motif. Elements of quotidian practices lay hidden within the depiction of the female figures. The everyday activities of the ladies, including uh, like here we have the lady playing with, uh, with the child. And then again, you have uh, this drink Shringar and you have the Prasadika who is carrying the toilet trays. Uh, so these are very interesting elements of one second. One picture is lost anyway. So, uh, so this uh, site actually offers us uh, very interesting uh, documents of everyday life activities. The drying of hair, uh, I'm, I think if I go to this, then maybe I would like to show the drying, yeah. So this is the drying of hair uh, that uh, we can find in one of the sculptures. Now I'll go to the main. So this, there is an effort to look beautiful, checking out their beauty or the process of beautifying themselves in a mirror and finally adorning themselves with jewelry. So you have different kinds of, uh, this is a very common scene of when we find that the mirror is being there. And here you can see in a corner railing, you have representations of the attendants who are always represented in a very small form. And then we have acrobatic uh, dancer. So this is a very interesting posture where you can see that lady is actually holding a pot and uh, it's a kind of an acrobat that she is practicing. So uh, they, these are uh, various moments of everyday life of a woman, and some are also leisurely pursuits of the lady. Uh, this acrobatic dancer or the, someone who is playing musical instruments or wine doing drinking uh, could be leisure activities. But one has to keep, so uh, this acrobatics would, like, would keep the body in shape the other was to indulge in entertainment and the pleasures of life. So we can see this uh, fantastic sculpture uh, of a lady, sorry, who is, who she is being, uh, the excavators have, have named it Madhupana. So you can see uh, the, her face and you can see the kind of inebriated status she is in. Now regarding the acrobats, 
we have such uh, games like balancing balls or playing with balls known as kanduka krida which was seen in mathura and is mentioned in dandi's dashakumara charita but this is quite unique to sangol and in the dashakumara charita we get an interesting description of a ball game played in a festival uh, called kanduka in the city of damalipta tamralipta that wine drinking was prevalent is evident from the representation of wine pitcher um being uh, carried by women and the here is the you can see here is the wine pitcher which is being carried by a uh, woman and then there was uh, sculptures demonstrate uh, uh this is of course i'm trying to show that this is from uh, mathura and how the mathura sculptures were also similar and this a uh, notion of uh, a drunken female was also very much represented in the sculptures of uh, mathura so intoxication so here you have there was a possibility uh, that the lady is intoxicated and the particular uh, the parallel theme that we find in mathura is this is the famous you all of you know the maholi sculpture and so this uh, which is now in the national museum so wine drinking was popularized by the skithians in mathura as mathura was under the rule of the indo skithians who were philhellenic in the pre kushan period so women in a drunken state have been represented in a few sculptures here too and the sculpture uh, the maholi has also i just mentioned that it has attracted the attention of uh, many scholars and these are known as generally referred to as bacchanalian scenes so these leisurely pursuits equal urban life and it is an um, a kind of an archive where an urban feature in the architecture of uh, also uh, draws uh, attention so we shall uh, uh, talk about uh, the uh, the kind of uh, uh, particularly this uh, the kind of objects that were being used for example if you see this bowl it is very typical gangaran pattern of inverted lotus and this kind of bowl is also found this is a pillar which is decorated it is found in the cleveland museum of art and in this pillar uh, if you see the below this this part then there is a pot i have a yes here you can see the same gandharan pattern of inverted lotus leaves is used in mathura so mathura sangol they belong to the same kind of arts art historical activities and therefore it is very important that um wine drinking becomes a part of or intoxication becomes a part of the life of the mathura uh, people mathura urbans uh, thing and under i would like you to also to notice this uh, balcony portion this is known as you here we find the onlookers and i'll come to that a little later that onlookers as a couple are very much seen in the art of sangol as well as in the art of mathura and of course in some areas of gandhara now <clears throat> coming to um, uh, uh, this um, uh, again i feel uh, come to the the importance of wine drinking in uh, in sangol we find that ardhendu kumar ray has uh, done a beautiful work he, his article has been published in the uh, indian proceedings of the indian history congress and uh, he shows that uh, in the context of sangol that production of wine uh was happening in sangol because through archaeological paleobotanical and sculptural examples uh, that he demonstrated that the seeds of wine uh, grape seeds were found and there were some uh, kind of experiments through which actually it was possible to say that sangol was probably pro uh, pro like having wine and uh, grapes and from there wine drinking was uh, possible lot of uh, images of distillation of wine drink wine or making of the wine is available from gandhara uh, but unfortunately from uh, mathura or from sangol we did not get such kind of uh, process uh, to show how wine was being made <coughs> what is interesting and uh, uh, in case of um, sangol also i just mentioned the balcony so who, who is uh, the beholder and the beholder is always there looking at something so here you have another mostly there in couples so conjugality is also 
uh, can understood from looking at these beholder couples. And this is also a very interesting, this is from Der Museum. Uh, it's part of the Gandharan repertoire, but I, had, I brought it to show that how this idea of beholders and how you can see that there is perhaps a wrestling going on. So there is something to watch. So there are people are watching from the balcony. So it is a kind of a pastime that uh, made the sculptors uh, put the beholders them uh, like when you have a pillar, you have a particular depiction and over that pillar, you have a beholder couple or mostly couple, sometimes one or two uh, individual persons. So therefore the notion of looking at something, some object, something is there. Uh, then this is here the lady, uh, she is playing a kind of an instrument. This is also found from Sangul. Uh, before, uh, what is another uh, interesting thing which I, for, I would like to say that uh, when we look at the sculptures from generally from this early historic Buddhist sites, we have a vast representation of the Jataka stories or the Avadana stories that we all know. But significantly, among the representations of Sangol, we do not find any Jataka narrative. Uh, as is common, I just mentioned on Bharat Sachi, and the absence of folk elements from the repertoire of sculptures uh, perhaps points out to the urban tradition of the site. Thus, here is a visual archive of stone sculptures within a sacred space, which provides a window to the lives of the elite woman in a given period, perhaps being a little irreverent to its location. We now move on to Bengal where we can locate an archive where the everyday comes alive in the terracotta tradition of both port towns and monastic sites, particularly in the present Bangladesh. It is important to note that the bulk of early terracotta from Bengal comes from the lower Bengal. Chandragitugar, which has been identified with Gange, but there is a question mark, of course, not fully understood, and Tomluk, that is Samrulipti, the two major nodes in the early historic period attained material prosperity, and this is marked by the presence of the elite class. Now, these sites possess the greatest concentration of the narrative plaques in northern India. Thus, the narrative plaques possibly made for decoration that we shall take upon to give us some idea of the day-to-day -day active life would be limited only to Lower Bengal, belonging to the early historic phase. Interestingly, these plugs depict both urban and rural phenomena. For the early medieval, we shall use the narratives from the Buddhist monastic sites. So here is this map where we can see here is Gange. This is a riverine port, and we have Tomralipta. This is Tomluk, which was the, we all know, the seaport. And many of the uh, sculptures that have been found from uh, Chandragitigar, similar types have also been found from Tomluk, sometimes in a better state, sometimes not in a, uh, not, uh, not that kind of better state. Mm -hmm. And here is the map of uh, the monastic sites. So we will be talking of these three sites. One is Pahadpur, Jagjivanpur, and Moinamurti. <coughs> So before uh, coming to the monastic side, uh, this uh, particular sculpture, uh, what I'd like to mention that remains of a number of monasteries have been unearthed in different parts of Bengal and in Bihar also. And uh, some of the things are very common to many of the monasteries, uh, this, the, uh, the kind of depiction of the plaques. But then there are also uh, the regional varieties, the sub-regional varieties, and so we can see the physiognomy, the face, how it changes. For example, the physiognomy of a plaque of a, of a woman from Paharpur will be different from the physiognomy that we find from a plaque from, um, from Mainamati. So these are the, some differences which has to be noticed also while studying the history of this uh, region. And these plaques were used for embellishment of the Buddhist monastery, and the themes were largely drawn upon by from the activities of contemporary society, along with some images of various animals and birds apart from the Buddhist deities. So a close look at this enables us to form the idea of the everyday life uh, in a rather disparate fashion. If uh, the apparent incongruence is overlooked, some broad commonalities may be noticed. Interactions between different levels of culture in the society are frequently encountered. 
The terracotta plaques indicate an attempt at standardization of costume, ornament, decoration, posture, etc., which lead us to believe that the terracotta artists walked on the basis of a convention sanctioned by long usage. In this archive of clay sculptures, we have representation of women belonging to the upper echelons of the society. They are often portrayed with attendants. And you can see here the attendants. Here, uh, this attendance is carrying some kind of uh, bottles or features. And here we have attendants with things that are could be sweetmeats or any other thing. But the interesting thing is that they are uh, they, uh, the, the differentiation between the mistress and the attendants is through size. So size here is very important. So, uh, and class differentiation is not manifested through the attire, but mainly through the sign. Uh, at Sangul also, we saw the Pasadika, but there we did not find these differences. We, you have seen Pasadika carrying the uh, lady, carrying the, or the toiletries of the mistress, but this kind of size differences, we do not find so much, not so much visible in Sangul as it is visible in the sculptural art of Chandragatibar. Specialized craftspersons, their products and their workshop have figured in the economic historiography, which highlights the importance of artisanal activities as a factor of urbanization. Many of the, uh, many of the sites have specialized crafts, but in the sense of varied crafts production, Chandraketugar uh, remains unparalleled. This is a plaque from Chandraketugar, datable to second century CE, and it depicts three artisans or craftsmen engaged in manufacturing. Behind them are stacked a large number of finished products. Uh, see, you can see the perhaps the bundles of ropes stacked one above the other. Coconut being a common plant of Bengal, this scene is quite um, probable as this could be made of coconut. Chandragutagar has a riverine port in all probability transported these bundles to other areas through riverine communications. And the Delta region riverine networks were the predominant means of communication and boat building as an occupation. We know that it was an occupation very much of this Delta region and uh, early India had only stitched boats. So such that such kinds of um, the things, uh, coconut coir or jute um, wire, they were, they were really important for uh, stitching the boats. Then again, Chandrakatagar offers us a harvesting scene. It is a fragmentary terracotta plaque, uh, datable on stylistic grounds to the early centuries. These are all very early terracottas, early centuries of CE. And here, three peasants are portrayed as harvesting ripened crops with sickle. Uh, some things do not change, and that we can see by the image of the sickle. The sickles are similar to the ones that we often use today. It is a realistic depiction of harvesting. Similar harvesting scenes have also been found from Tomluk. Uh, this was a significant aspect of the daily life of a peasant during the harvesting season. So these scenes uh, finally culminated in a beautiful representation of a harvesting festival. Uh, so this is, this is fragmentary broken, but at least we can have some idea uh, depicted in a plaque also from Chandrakirtigar, and this also can be dated between from first to the second century CE. Here it is the depiction of a procession led by musicians, and we find a bejeweled elephant. You can see this elephant who is bejeweled uh, follows the musicians who are playing on the drum and a long flute. In the background, two men are can be seen carrying the harvested crop. So here a seasonal event is being represented which marks the grandeur and importance of a harvest festival in a predominantly urban milieu. The rural surroundings of the riverine port site, the impact of agrarian life in a non-agrarian milieu would have led the terracotta artists to produce such a plaque. Now we come to a very interesting um, thing. I was just talking to, um, before we started about this to Parul. And um, what is, uh, we know that uh, there is uh, that among all the games and sports uh, prevalent in early India, dicing had no doubt the, the prime uh, position. 
The game became an integral part of urban life by the second century BC. And even in the, when we look at the Kama Sutra, we find in the house of a, a Nagaraka, a, a dice board is very much there. So it is a part of the life of an urban man. So, and then we have beautiful descriptions of gambling houses, uh, which occupied an important role in the urban landscape and where uh, there were uh, elaborate roles. Uh, we have in Mrichakatika also, then we have Padatika, where we have references to uh, gambling houses. Uh, I would like to later on uh, work on uh, see some kind of a comparison to understand that um, uh, the functionality of these gambling houses, but now I couldn't do that. Uh, the Jatakas and the Jataka Mala also portray a lively picture of the Dyson world. King Vidura Pandita loses all his wealth, official kingdom, and wife, you know, in a dice game, which is represented in the Vidura Pandita Jataka. Thus, dice was an integral part of the urban world, involving everybody from kings and chiefs to the poorest gambler. Now, have a look at this piece. It's a beautiful piece. And when I found this piece, I was a little uh, skeptical about its uh, uh, its genuine uh, genuineness because we all know that Chandrakatagar has also has been infamous for uh, the production of uh, by a particular group of people of some fake terracottas which are now surviving or thriving I should say in the uh, private collections of both Europe and US, uh, but. So there was a kind of, when I saw this, there was a kind of trepidation. I wanted to show this because it stood so well with my arguments, but at the same time, there was this trepidation that perhaps it could be fake. I contacted Professor Vidya Dehija, uh, who as you all know, is an expert on, uh, on these kind of things. And she uh, acknowledges that there are many terracottas which are fake, but she says that uh, she knows the, uh, the uh, who, uh, the collector who has this and it has been tested and so therefore and it was broken actually and then and brought together and perhaps therefore it is uh, its genuineness uh, cannot be questioned uh, so uh, with this uh, armed with this conversation I'm bringing this to in front of you and you can see that if you look carefully uh, some the significant point is that we have the presence of the elites. So here you have a nobleman, he could be a ruler, he could be a governor, minister, whatever, but he is an important person. He's sitting there and there is a parasol. And then you have the chori bearers. So the chori bearers are there and this is the uh, women attendants are there and there are plates of food. And here you can see one, at least one spouted vessel and all of them are having, are holding some kind of a, a cup. You can see if you look uh, carefully, so here is that one and uh, all of them who are viewing. So the game is going on, perhaps it's a gamble and there are spectators and this is a milieu which is in the open. It is not in a, in a room, in a clubhouse or something like that. And there are food so people can come, watch the game, buy food, have a drink. Uh, it gives me this kind of an uh, atmosphere, uh, but it is very striking. And then of course we have this couple who are locked in a very um, uh, an amorous, uh, amorous prose. So there are different kinds of things. Here is also again another lady. So this, uh, this sculpture offers us huge, huge, uh, hugely interesting details of the pastime of details of amusements uh, that was perhaps a part of the life of these people. So you have the royalty and of course uh, the, the dicer, the game player, and then the attendants and then somebody and the people who were looking. And if we look at this, uh, then we can see because the background is there. So in front, there would be some people. And so therefore, uh, who could be the spectators who could have uh, actually gambled. Uh, and you, therefore you can see the way they are all looking uh, this side, but we don't know what was there. So this is a very striking uh, image. And therefore I, 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 since I got it very recently and didn't get the time uh, to match this image with 
for that to um, pick a description of gambling with dice which is closed and which is um, where I know that it is mentioned that it is close to an eatery house and a drinking house. Uh, here, uh, just to show you that the kind of uh, games that would be, and these are the dice that we all know are found from various early historical uh, sites. Uh, and uh, recently, Chandrakirti, earlier also dice has been found, but recently all I heard that uh, the archaeological survey of India people have also found some ivory dice from Chandrakirtukar. Uh, narrative plots. Uh, now I come to the uh, on music, dancing, and on that aspect of enjoyment. Uh, narrative plots invo invoke time and again an important social group comprising the musicians. From the early historical sites to the early medieval monastic sites, musicians with their musical instruments are distinctly visible. Either represented as a part of social occasions or individually, they include drummers, both male and female, harp players, flute players, and dancers. From textual sources too, we get numerous references to musicians and dancers. It appears that though not from the elite group, they did not also represent the impoverished in the society. Here, we would like to draw attention to a plot in low, low relief from Chandra Ketugar, datable to 1st to 2nd century CE. So this you can see, it is, uh, it is in very low relief. And one thing I forgot to mention, when we see this, we can see the high relief. So that actually, uh, we, we, we think that it is not from the early period of Chandrakatugar. Chandrakatugar flourished for some time. And so before, I think it's not the Gupta idiom also. Um, my The art historian friends will may correct me if I'm wrong. So uh, it is just pre-Gupta and late post century. So maybe around third century. Uh, CE, uh, this could be could have this kind of um, artist like the the kind of flexibility and the roundedness that has can be seen uh, could be made in that period because early terracottas are uh, not did not have a very high relief. So here is this example which is very crude, uh, but at least we know that there is a musician and there is a dancer and perhaps they are couple. couple. Of singular interest is a rattle that we find um, in, the, in the sites. And uh, what is interesting is that um, we have uh, this as a form of a female drummer uh, in all the available pieces. And these have been found quite a lot. And in some of the, in all the available pieces, she is bejeweled with long hair and plays the drum in front of her. So you can, one can see the long hair and the drum is in front of us. In some cases, the drums are decorated. These are the decorated drums. Her vibrant character is apparent from the depiction. Individual male and female dancers in small, uh, small plots were also quite popular, uh, though not portrayed with great artistic quality. Importantly, all these were recovered from layers between the first to the second or third century CE, where second urbanization reached its height in the Ganga Valley and Bengal also had its share of urban experiences in the form of secondary urbanization. The vibrancy of trade with agrarian expansion was felt in the sites of sites of Lower Bengal and Chandragatugar came up with the largest repertoire of objects relating to material culture. The terracottas from Chandrakatugar leading the trajectory in comparison to other sites um, is noteworthy. One plot with the theme of dance and music is also significant, but this is not from, uh, this is another, but I'm not talking of this. This is from Pilpi. This is not from Chandrakatugar, but it is from uh, another site. There were two sites called Tilpi and Gosha, uh, which had also been excavated, not very moments, um, maybe in, in around last 10 years. And here we find that uh, this site from um, uh, this uh, image from Pilpi, uh, it is a site in 24 Parganas and uh, there's a river blo like flowing through the site and it is known as the Piali River. But here the plant depicts, you can see it's the playing a lyre. He, he wears a turban, so there are quite uh, not a very impoverished group, but they are having uh, some kind of good life. Uh, then uh, we find uh, earrings, stole bracelets, and lower garment with a thick sash. A female figure can be seen dancing to his left. Uh, she wears a torque. 
necklace and earrings, bracelets and girdles. There is a hut-like structure. So here is a behind her. So this is uh, from Tilpi. And what is striking also, uh, this is perhaps an incense burner. So if this is an incense burner, then uh, I think that uh, the ambience was made for uh, this are used also in rituals. So there is an ambience of music, dance, and um, enjoyment was there. Now from that, I will um, bring you, uh, or, or I'll take you to two poignant pieces of um, sculpture. One uh, which is there in the poster uh, today, and the other is this one. Now, if in this, yes, uh, here you can see the glimpses of a moment in the day. And on this plaque, uh, if you can see, this is datable to first to second century CE, we can see a male figure and he has a pole and there are perhaps baskets he's carrying. He wears a loin cloth and holds the pole with his left hand. His right hand is raised to the cheek and he's in a thoughtful gesture. Female figure is there holding a cup. Um, so she holds a cup and then we can see a pot and there is the oven. So, but note, please note the oven. It is a very simple oven. Uh, on the other side also, we can see an uh, 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 oven and it, uh, the posture shows that he is living, he's just going out uh, for, um, um, for, his every, uh, for his everyday work. Uh, so this, uh, this is definitely a basket which might contain many things for selling. So this depiction, this sculpture obviously gives us an idea of a house which is uh, not a very affluent house. So it is quite a reflection of an impoverished um, house, impoverished family. But then uh, when we go to the next, um, here comes an elite group of family. And uh, this is actually housed in Metropolitan Museum of Indian Art, uh, Met, uh, Met Museum, sorry, Met Museum in New York. And uh, in um, this, uh, it, you can see from the very description, very, very depiction, that it, it portrays an elite family. The dignified looking male with the turban on his head is seated on a high back decorated chair with his left hand. Here you can see his left hand extended towards a lady in all probability, his wife. She's a tall, elegant lady, nicely dressed with an elaborate headgear. Below the couple sits their child, equally well-dressed and holding a dog by a chain. So two ducks and a monkey complete the picture. The affluent household is also evident from an architectural motive. That is, the, you can see the pavilion and the two slender columns supporting the roof. So this actually gives you an idea of uh, affluence uh, that could be seen in the, uh, in the sculptures of Chandraketugar. Now I, I would like to bring to you uh, yeah, this is again one sculpture, which I'm not very sure of uh, from which place. Uh, but it is, I have brought this to show you, particularly the oven. So you can see this oven is different from the one that we saw in the house of that poor couple. And here it is probably a scene uh, which shows it is an out, like it's an outdoor scene. So we have an outdoor scene, uh, family is there. Uh, he's playing something here. We can see the musical instrument. We have people harvesting season is there. So people carrying the harvest uh, to the house. So here in this plaque, there is a kind of a depiction of an outdoor activity as well as of harvesting. But I don't, since I don't know the provenance, like it says that it's from Chandraguttagar, uh, but I don't know its authenticity. But I wanted to show you uh, because one aspect was that the kind of oven uh, that we find that are being used here. And se secondly, uh, another reason was there because this plaque is displayed in the Chandraketugar Museum in Barachapa. This place is in not 24 Paraganas near Chandraketugar. And we have similar type of, if you look at this hut, uh, one door, one window, and here in the front you have a porch-like thing. 
this one door, one window is very much evident in this hut also. So a similar pattern could be noticed in this depiction. And these leaves, these trees are very common. But here too, we find a, a very interesting scene uh, where uh, actually you can see two monkeys here. So is it the playing, they are playing with the monkeys or um, just enjoying uh, the children are on the, on the tree. So uh, the, all in all, it can be said that it is a very happy moment, enjoyable moment, and they are enjoying their leisure. And this has been represented by through this sculpture. This sculpture is now housed in the Museum of Oriental Art in Turin, Italy. And here, uh, I, it's, I'm not very sure, but my question is uh, that perhaps we can say that it is depicting a kind of a ritual performance. Uh, you can see this tree, there is this Vedika. And uh, if I, I don't know this, I can, yeah, if I can project it, you can see a conch here. And the ladies, the lady, they are carrying uh, food items, of course, offerings. And then again, you have this person who is perhaps making something, uh, looks like flowers, then if it is perhaps is making a flower garland, uh, garland. And so you have, sorry. So in this image, you have uh, this depiction of a ritual which is being performed. This lady is of course from an elite or a nobility or from a royal household because we have chori bearer with her. Uh, so over and all, it is representing the upper echelons of the society, but it is a kind of an um, activity which may not be daily, but may have some congruence uh, with uh, the everyday life in the sense that sometimes you have the reflection of the ritual performance and that is being uh, drawn in, the, in this narrative. And here is a portion of the hut also where this person is sitting. Here you have the uh, pictures. So this is open to um, explanation and I would like to have comments on this. Then comes the notion, very important uh, question of conjugality and sexuality. Conjugality was generally taken uh, to be marriage and was uh, intricately linked with uh, home. So in case of Bengal, many terracotta plaques from Chandragutti were offered this kind of conjugality and which is of course uh, entwined with sexuality. So uh, there were depictions of couples in Damaras dalliance and um, sex is of course a very important part of daily life of the pleasure and, uh, of the, and the urban ethos of life is portrayed through these plaques. Uh, sometimes you, here you can see the interior of the bedroom is shown. What is interesting, this is a bed with four uh, thing, four stands, and here is a picture. So this is, it seems to be an important portrait of having a picture beneath the bed and uh, in the corner. And this we found that in, uh, it is perhaps a, an urban setting, um, because if you look at the, uh, the borders and other things, and placing of a picture be, uh, below the bed could be a common tradition because we have other plaques. These are some of the pictures that have been found from excavations and they are very decorative. Uh, but normally, if you find this, this plaque, this is of one of those early plaques. So you can see the roundity is not there. It's very angular, the depth is not there, but you can see this feature. And this is actually the depiction of a room because this is the bed. And so the eroticism is there, the sexuality is there. But what strikes me when I think of everyday life, uh, the use of this feature. So these kind of things, the minor things, this is a very minor thing that placing a feature, but that was the way of life. And these things should be taken note of when we are studying uh, uh, in general, the social history or history of everyday life. So I found this very striking that you have a uh, similar uh, depiction of features. So it was probably uh, a kind of a traditional practice uh, that uh, you have water when you are sleeping. This is also from a larger plaque. You have many, many, many scenes. And here it is 
the it is of course again conjugality and we have a, a closer uh, view of you know, this as you can see uh, now i will close quickly move into uh, the from the terracotta archives of the port towns uh, we should proceed to the clay sculptures that are adorning the various Buddhist monasteries of early medieval Bengal. Uh, so here you have, I showed this map before also, but again, uh, Paharpur, which was known also as Shomapur, Jagjibanpur, and then Mainamati. And these are uh, during the, like, uh, Paharpur was found uh, in the 8th century, and, um, uh, and uh, uh, it is around the end of the 8th century by Dharmapala. So you have this, these are mostly very closer in time. And in the scheme of decoration of the walls of the temples, we find the terracotta plaques play a, uh, played a very distinctive role. As I mentioned that I don't have my own collection here, which I got from thing, but these were the sums which I used in some other or other purposes. But here also you can see uh, the posture, the dancing posture, and then uh, you have this as an archer, and uh, then again you have this is an acrobat. Uh, you have this thing, the warriors. So these kind of uh, things are found uh, in the. It is these are in situ in Paharpur. So one can see that how this in the embell the Buddhist monasteries were embellished. And so here you have daily activities of common men, common women. Uh, cultivators carrying plows and many other things uh, that could be seen from these uh, terracotta panels. Uh, so just to give you a brief overview of these uh, things, but you have actually uh, many important things that can be shown that which belong to the everyday life, like the pastime. So you have acrobatics and others. Uh, acrobats were also working as entertainers in early India, if we uh, all know. And among the autochthonous groups, uh, we find the depiction of Shabara men and women, uh, which grains by primacy. Uh, Shabaras, we all know that were forest people and were familiar to the people of the settled society. They often lived on the fringes of a village. This is reflected in the Charjapada, uh, where a Charjapada is a text, actually. It was, these were composed in from 10 to 12 centuries by the Buddhist Siddhyacharyas and who were initiated into the Sahajya doctrine. This text is unique in the sense that here the commoner is visible and audible. The center stage is occupied by the people belonging to the lower rungs of the society, pursuing kinds of occupations for which they are regarded as culturally inferior to others who are generally shut out by the elite society. So though deep down the text is highly spiritual, the similes and the metaphors expressed if read carefully, gives us an idea of the contemporary social life in general. So we have representations of Shavara couple or Shavara man with bows and uh, 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 quivers and taking out bows and other things. Here you can see the portrayal of an old man. He is running from a hunt. Uh, and this is a very powerful visual of a Shavara hunter. So you can see the way his ribs also can be seen. And then he is going through this, maybe for uh, just kind of a bow, and he's carrying some animal with him after hunting, he's coming up. So this is a very, uh, this uh, features, this pronounced rib cage bent with the weight of the hunt is vividly rendered. So this, this is a stereotype of the Shavaras, which was visualized. We know in Harsha Charita how the Shavara hero was depicted and in what way. So I'm not bringing that here. But in case of Mainamati depictions, we have this representation of the Shavara old man. So their appearance and quotidian experiences, if you look at them, did not go parallel to the life in the agrarian or urban uh, society, which is captured in textual or field archaeological and visual sources. So uh, this is a random, uh, I've just put in here, this is actually from Vikram Shila. So just to uh, let you know that, uh, that this kind of things we find in the Buddhist, all the Buddhist uh, monastic uh, monasteries, uh, some in some we have more like Paharpur and Mainamati and others, but in others also we have, this is a very 
I liked it very much when I went to Vikram Shila and uh, this, uh, I found that, that the kind of thing that we find in sculptures, this is actually uh, represented in, uh, in clay. <clears throat> now I'm moving to the site of Jagjibanpur in northern part of West Bengal, and it is in Malda, not uh, area near, very near to Malda. And it offers a monastery which was functioning at least 12th uh, century CE. Like in other cases here too, the area of terracotta sculptures is striking. Men and women are seen engaging in diverse activities, but from the point of view of archive, and I thought that this is really could be used as an archive because the stunning discovery of depictions of warriors on 150 plaques out of the total 387 plaques depicting various scenes cannot be lost sight of. So there is a quantification. All of them are foot soldiers carrying sword, shield, staff or bow and arrow with a powerful physique. Any study on depictions of foot soldiers has to take this archive into consideration. It is thus archive within an archive. Now the crucial question is, why do we have them represented in a Buddhist monastic site? The artists must have seen them around and the patron probably wanted them represented. In the words of Gautam Shengupta, he suggested that it could be some charm to protect the sacred space against a perceived threat to the monastery, or they could depict a collective memory of a warrior tradition evident in uh, regional folklore. Um, but uh, we have also depiction of warriors on, in other monastic sites, but not as many as in Jagdivanpur. Here too, this is a very interesting plaque that has been found from Jagdivanpur. I do not know, this is also an old man representation. Uh, uh, look at the long hair and he is, and there is a string which is strung to this particular uh, thing which is holding. So it could be uh, the posture shows a kind of a dancing, uh, a movement, and it could be a kind of a dhol, uh, but I'm not sure, I don't know, but it looks like that it could be a musical instrument, it could be something like a dhol. dhol. Uh, from Jagjibanpur, we now move to the southeast, and that is the, my last site, and take a close look at the terracotta plaques from Shalvan Bihara in Mainamati in present Kumilla of Bangladesh, uh, the terracotta out of Mainamati is almost entirely represented by the sculptured plaques found in situ in the basement walls of the shrine. Uh, and these plaques provide a snapshot. This is an aerial view of the Shalvan Monastery. You can see here, these are the beautiful uh, the cells, which were now covered with grass of the famous monastic site. <coughs> and here too, these plaques provide a snapshot of the life of the village around the monastery, and then some could be compared to the depiction at Baharpur, though the artistic treatment varies, which I was saying, the physiognomy, if you look, and these were different. So though these plaques are profusely decorated with portraits of human, divine, semi-divine, beings, birds, and animals, most of other things are this, these are Candice's Kutila Mura, another site within Mainamati, and these are the niches from where you actually, the plaques uh, were uh, fitted in. So you have a uh, basic uh, like uh, plaques with warrior that we find from Mainamati too. So here again with uh, warrior, Mainamati Museum, uh, then again, a lot of warriors, but in different posture. And look at the faces, the faces are very really different. And then here you, you have the lady. So this is uh, this heaviness, the bulging eyes, the heaviness of the lips. This is very typical of Mainamati, southeastern Bang Bengal, which had a very close connection with countries of Southeast Asia. And now if I take you to very quickly to uh, Paharpur, you will see that Paharpur ladies were very different. Uh, you can see the portrayal of the lady. It is more to uh, close to the Ganga Valley depiction of the physiognomy, Ganga Valley depiction of the features Whereas Mainamati is very much different. It is voluptuous. The port, the face is shows a very close uh, kind of a, a heaviness of the face, which is not very uh, like that we have in the Ganga Valley or in North Bengal. 
Uh, then we have representations of di uh, dancers and musicians also. I, I'm sorry, I don't have those um, plaques with me. Uh, from Bhoja Bihara, this is, a, this is taken from a book and so the quality is very bad. But you can see that this plaque has been found from Moinamati. And this is a man. an experience of an activity of a cultivator. So therefore, uh, wrestling, acrobatics, hunting, etc., all which are part of the everyday life uh, is, are seen. And then, of course, we have uh, these fish being represented, which could be a part because fish is a dietary, a very important dietary option of Bengal. And so you have representation of uh, fish, uh, both in Mayanamati and also in Paharpur. And there is one sculpture, as I remember, that the, the, the fish is being uh, made into pieces, and that was also uh, being depicted. So what we find is that um, the terracotta flats formed from Paharpur and Mainamati uh, also um, uh, gives us, um, I just mentioned about the food preferences. And <coughs> at, uh, at the end, I can say that what has been presented uh, now, in no way gives a total picture. We have captured some fragments, some moments of their life, and the rest mm, is left also to kind of an imagination. Um, so where uh, here it was an inquiry on the life itself that were led both by the elite and the commoner. And in understanding everydayness and attention to small components is also imperative. Uh, through examining the various sources, one can perhaps hear some voices of the everyday, while quite understandably there are other voices which remain unheard. So through the spectrum of the visuals, I was trying to put one voice and then if we juxtapose it with inscriptions, with text, then I, we can get a, some kind of a um, holistic picture. Uh, finally, I would like to say that uh, when we are coming back to archives, because going beyond the traditional archive was one of the motto of this presentation. Uh, so in a traditional archive, the primary object of uh, appraisal is to identify the documents to be continuously preserved on an unlimited period of time. The visual archive of stone and clay has stood the test of time and the integrity and impartiality of this archive is beyond question. This visual archive presented in the foregoing evocatively recreated facets of the quotidian lives of the people. Incidentally, there is no archivist in this archive, but for those objects which are located within the precinct of a museum, there are curators who act as archivists and decides upon the values of the objects. While in Sanghol, our classified archival data belong to the upper echelons of the society. In the Buddhist monasteries, the most mundane and intimate aspects of ordinary lives are recreated in these unclassified sculptures. Chandragatuga provided a window of both the upper echelons of the society, the middle class, and also the poor. However, these sculptures are not transparent windows, as I said before, that archive is not a transparent windows for understanding the past. They need to be viewed with, scape, with care, scrutinized, and selected with diligence. History of every day archived in stone and clay has an endearing and enduring uh, value. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, ma'am, for the wonderful presentation. I would love, uh, I would like to invite Professor Seema, ma'am, to have a closing remark on this, then we can have go take a question. Thank you so much, Professor Ghosh, because I teach a paper on social history of art in which I do leisure. So, and uh, so this like really works well into both pleasure and leisure, which are both things that I teach and have, right. uh, you know, I work on. So I'm, I'm so happy that a lot of things that uh, I discuss in class have been elaborated upon. So thank you for that. Uh, I have a few comments and yes, some please, kinds please, of please. observations, like uh, one Sanghol, you know, uh, Sanghol where you've looked at uh, some of the so-called Yakshi, uh, yeah. Yoshita figures and uh, kind of, uh, you know, uh, basically what I think is that the discourse of beauty 
and the discourse of physicality is very important when it comes to that. Uh, within that only, what you call the onlooker figures, I've called the spectator figures, but that's just, just uh, whatever. You know, uh, in some of these, there's a skirtin like. Yeah, one, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, one I like, distinctly remember. Yeah, there was yeah. A boy so, and also the... this one in uh, Mathura in a similar way. Yeah, yeah. I was yeah. just thinking if we can discuss, you can talk a little bit about performativity. Right. Yeah, that there could be something about performativity that mm -hmm. I find is very interesting and could be there. And Monica Zin also is uh, also uh, talked a little bit about that. Uh, the demonization of the servant figures, which is like uh, very much part of the art tradition, which is hierarchical, you know, there's hierarchical scaling where the important people are uh, made bigger. So that I think is one clue in through which we can enter these kind of uh, everydayness and the class structures that you've talked about. Shabras, I found it fascinating. If you can just talk a little bit about how we, how do we look at the shabras in terms of representation especially in literary representations also because yes, yes, that would be yes, i would i would yeah. especially you know because i teach a little bit about the tribals so okay. i think my students would especially also find it very very interesting to you know have a little bit about uh, hear more about the shabras sure you know? yeah yes, and then of course we'll take questions yes very good thank you so much for your comments yes performative art definitely i i didn't bring it i should have brought it and uh, yes, Parul, I will, uh, uh, Sparul has some questions, we'll uh, talk. Uh, so may I answer to you, Seema, now? Yes, and please, yes, please, yes, 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 yes. So uh, now, uh, so that is well taken, performative tradition, and as you mentioned, the curtains. And if you remember the um, the sculpture which I showed you, the Der Museum thing, that yeah. up, it is also, you know, there were curtains in the- uh, Exactly. Like, there. So it is also a kind of a theater or performance, something like, like it was like a balcony and with having uh, long curtains and that. So it yeah. is very much there. I totally agree with you. Yeah. Yes, yeah. thank you. Uh -huh. And uh, yeah, Shabaras are actually, if <coughs> in case, I'm talking in case of Bengal, mm -hmm. uh, in general for Shabara, um, Harsha Charita gives a very uh, fantastic description of the Shabara man, uh, how he is looking at and the kind of how it's about his physique and other things. But I'm talking about the poor Shabaras. And then the clue is in Chajagiti. In Chajagiti, because I mentioned that they talk of the common people, you have such wonderful descriptions. Like the, in the song, uh, camphor comes in and you will be like stunned. They are talking, there's a song where they are talking of uh, that they will have pan with karpura because having a pan with a karpura is a dream. They cannot think of having. So they will have sex and then they will have with pan with karpura. And then the line is maha suhe rati pohaili. Maha suhe rati prohaili suhe is sukhe. So the, uh, the, the, in the morning, like they get up in the morning and they have a whole night uh, like with the karpur. So the aspiration of a pan with the karpur is there, camphor is there in their life. So this, uh, and then again, there's a description that they are uh, living in their, uh, the kind of secludedness that they are being put, in, uh, they're put into by the society. Because if you read even, you know very well by how Manur says that these kind of people should be in the marginal people and should be in the outskirts of the main um, locality. And so in the Charjaviti uh, also, even in 12th, 13th century, they say that we are very sick, alone because we are living in a hilltop and we don't have neighbors there but again they are very happy that there is a there is a kind of a rice which is a flavored rice so they have a little plot and when the rice is done they have the this gandhe matiali so you the the fragrance is actually uh, giving you a kind of a uh, uh, this pleasure and they talk about this so there are very small small details which actually Chajagiti brings in when it comes to the life of a Savara. So it's a beautiful, like one, if you uh, want, I can give you the full reference of this. Shabara, I have brought to you. Please do, please do. Article. Yeah. So it's a fantastic uh, reading of Chajagiti and there are translations also. So you can. Thank you, thank you. I won't take more of your time. We can of course talk anytime, yes, but I'm sure the sure. students and Parul and everybody else have questions. Yeah, so yeah. I'll thank let you. Thank you so much, yes. I mean, ma'am, we have questions from Facebook. 
So can we go with that? Uh, man, uh, can we take a question from Parul first? Yeah, Parul ma'am, please. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, uh, first of all, thank you very, very much, uh, uh, Professor Ghosh, for this fabulous presentation. I must say that you garnered a, a really diverse range of material and, uh, and brought it to us. It was an absolute delight. Uh, my questions are actually very simple. Uh, I have two with the permission of the chair. Uh, the first one is just, you know, just as I was looking at all, all the material that you were uh, sharing with us, uh, there is a certain dom, you know, there, there are certain dominant themes as, as you, you, you know, you would have anyway noticed. Uh, playful attitudes, amorous attitudes, dance music, harvesting, mm -hmm. uh, festivities, erotica, Mm. So I was wondering, you know, if we if we look at uh, individual plaques as a separate context in which visuality is encountered, visuality of everyday life is encountered, and if we look at uh, their presences as part of other religious monuments, where too you have the quotidian and you know the you know the, the pleasure and the leisure aspects and the erotica, etc. But if, if we, for a while, conceptually separate out these two contexts in which uh, your, your material uh, was presented today, the thought just occurred to me uh, whether the, particularly the, the, the uh, individual panels could be understood in terms of, you know, you know in, in, in pre-modern, in, in early modern and modern times, you have these portraits, port portraitures, mm -hmm. uh, and so that only those fragments of the past are deliberately projected by an elite uh, nobility or, or the rich or those who can afford, uh, that they, I mean, this is how they want to be remembered. Mm -hmm. And this is how uh, they, they leave their uh, signatures of the past. Uh, you know, alive. Uh, whereas uh, ritual festivities and processions and all, of course, occur on Buddhist stupas. There's a very beautiful one uh, of the elephant and the festivities on the Fanigiri uh, yes. uh, Torana also, if you would have noticed. So that, that's, yeah. that's one thing that I'd love to know your opinion on. And the, the second one is uh, very simple. Actually, it is more broad-based which is in your research on the quotidian so far, uh, what is your opinion about the relative potential of uh, traces or sources, I'd like to call them traces of the ancient past? Uh, does the visual archeological dominate as I would like to believe in, in as, as a trace of the quotidian or does the literary textual also throw up an equal measure of, or an, is there a difference in the nature of the quotidian that comes across in these two sources? So that's about it. Thank yeah. you. Uh, thank you so much, Parul. Um, you are being uh, very formal with me, but I, <laughs> I just would like to call you Parul and not Professor Pandya. Okay, uh, Suchandra. <laughs> I hope you don't mind. No, I will ask because the first uh, question, uh, the first comment, actually, I take it as a comment and uh, it is very thought-provoking comment and of course uh, taking one at a time and looking at a panel so it needs a lot of more deliberation and for uh, the here in this discussion I did not bring the question of patron so because uh, for the simple reason uh, the I uh, the material that we find from Chandragadugar or um, say the monastic of course the monasteries these have a pattern so it is the monks or this there is a larger plan and so all the monasteries are made in similar lines and so therefore there is a uh, there is somebody who is organizing these things or they could, could be anybody from the monastic side the monastic head or anyone or the royal patrons or the, how the common men were depicted and other things but for chandra uh, material in particular uh, it is very difficult to have a kind of uh, to understand that who could be the patron. So uh, you very rightly said that it is the, the person who is actually commissioning to make these things 
want it in this way, want it the wants the representation of these kind of things. Otherwise, why should, how should this come into focus, come to being? So therefore, uh, we do not have an answer uh, to the to who is the patron or uh, or who actually commissioned them because if for Chandragatuka we don't even know the ruler who was the ruler during that time because otherwise we do not have any kind of information about the political history of that period from Bengal as you know uh, so uh, therefore I totally agree with you that uh, they, this is something which has to be thought of that how do we engage when we think of individual sculptures and we think of panel and um, what is the motive behind the depiction. Your second question is very striking. Uh, I I'll be very frank and say that I have, if I have to weigh between the archaeological, uh, art historical plus archaeological and the textual sources, um, being a person who has worked on mostly on epigraphy, as you know, uh, and uh, now a little bit looking at the sculptural material without any training, so just trying to have some kind of understanding and with uh, like a little bit of reading. Uh, I, I think the visuals and the archaeological material, for me, in a scale, if I have to weigh, I would put them more of, uh, in a higher place because for me, they give us give me the kind of um, the vivacious representations that can be found. Um, I did not find so much in texts, but I have a limitation. I have seen certain texts and texts are some, sometimes, you know, in some texts, uh, they are uh, very conventionalized also that you have a kind of a common description. But in some cases I found like, for example, who can deny the importance of uh, the Kama Sutra for the life of a Nagaraka? So we cannot understand an urban male of early historic India without reading Kama Sutra, the life of a Nagaraka, the man about the town. Or, for example, I have recently worked on uh, these thieves from Mirchakatika. So that was an absolute textual study, the Jataka stories. So I think though I have seen more of the visuals and other things, so here lies a kind of, a, it is a dilemma uh, that can we really say, though I said in the beginning that I put art historical visuals in, in a, on a higher scale, in the sense that we can see that we can, uh, the portrait is so live, in, it is so lively and it's in front of us. But if we read the literature, in some cases, the literature also opens a window. Dashukumara Charita, for example, is a wonderful text from where you can get so much. And therefore I said that I, uh, I would like to match. I know that sources are different and the sources can be discordant. My teacher, Professor Bian Mukherjee would always say that you have to look at the sources. The course sources can give you discordant notes, but the many voices of the sources can be understood. And so I think that it is difficult to weigh, um, though initial reaction was like to in favor of visuals, but on a second thought, I think the best is to have a holistic study of juxtaposition of the text and the visuals and look for some kind of uh, indications in the epigraphic uh, literature, epigraphic walls also. Thank, <laughs> thank, you, thank you so much, thank you. Thank you, ma'am. So, ma'am, can we move to the questions uh, from the Facebook? Yeah, please. So, ma'am, uh, do we need to read the entire question or we can go for by one by one? One by one would be better. Okay, I'm, fine. I don't have a very good memory. Fine, fine. Ma'am, the first question is the detailed scene of the dice game betrays similarity with the Vidura Pandita Jataka depicted in Cave 2 at Ajanta. Yeah. Also, reminiscent of the dice game between Kauravas and Pandavas in the Mahabharata. So I have actually mentioned Vidura. I didn't bring, that was on purpose. I didn't bring in Mahabharata dice here because that would be a different kind of story. But Vidura Pandita Jataka have already mentioned that we have such a, band. I'm just back from actually uh, Ajanta and it's so vivid. Thank you, ma'am. The next question is, you spoke on the presence and absence in visual archives of pre-modern times. 
how could absence expand the scope of everyday and the quotidian? Uh, I did I speak of the absence of what? Absence in visual archives of pre-modern times. No, I think uh, I misunderstood here. I said that traditional archives, when we are talking of traditional archives, like a student of uh, the modern India, when they will look for some material, they, my friends, they always go to the archives because the archives provides the classified and the non-classified data for us. But for students of early India, like me, Professor Bawa or Professor Pandyadhar who is here. So here we find that we don't have a such kind of an archive. So my aim in this paper was to expand the notion of archive and look at the visuals as a form of archive and bring in those, those elements because quantification is one of the very important thing, then uh, that how much uh, secured that is, which at the, at the end I said, and uh, the question of security in the case of visuals are so much that it's there in, uh, in stone. So that was what was my argument. And the next question is, I was wondering about the artistic representations of the concept of event in juxtaposition to every day. Can any distinction be found there in their representations? Yeah, okay, this is a very important question uh, because um, the problem is that when we, uh, we are bringing in the concept of every day, uh, the theoretical, I have uh, introduced a theoretical uh, base to my lecture. And when I look at the theoretical base, they, these articles are mostly concerned about the medieval and the modern period. Like when uh, Brodel is talking of structure of everyday life, he's not talking of the ancient past. So uh, the kind of material that is available there, it is, pro, uh, it is easy to have a continuous uh, kind of uh, depiction of every day. But when we are coming to the past, then and within also, and yeah, I must uh, uh, say this also, that even in the Brodelian description of every day, as I mentioned in the beginning, that he says that there is, the event is also part of every day in the sense that it is happening regularly. For example, when there is a festival, we have a calendar. So that festival will occur next year, that year after next, the year after next. So maybe it is not every day per se, but it can be considered as a part of our everyday study because it has a structure and structure is a very important notion of Brazilian understanding of every day. And so it has a structure. So there is an invariance. So when there is an invariance, uh, then of course one brings in the kind of events. So for me, this understanding of every day is also can be related even to a moment of a day. Like for example, that person who was going out, which I showed that going out in the morning, that was the moment of a day in the morning. And that is the part of his, maybe he's not going out every day in such a way, but that moment is captured. So for me, every day entails events and also moments. Yeah, um, the, another question is, when we look at themes like the leisure and their description in the literature like Dandin's Daksha uh, Kumara Charitra and Bana's Har Harsha Charitra, were you able to also uncover some political meanings beyond there? Sometimes very elaborate descriptions. Yeah, actually my presentation was on, uh, on basically the visual archives, but political meaning, if you, the basic story of Dandi's Dashakamara Charita has a kind of like, the, if you know the background, then of course there are political meanings. And then because these are all princes, princes moving around in different places. And then when we come to Kandruka, I mentioned Kanduka Krida, that Kanduka Krida was, it was the game of a ball which was uh, being played by Kandukavati. She was a princess and then therefore, and then the story goes in a different line. And in Harsha Charita, there is a political meaning, of course, but I'm not willing to bring the political meaning in the discussion of everyday life, the way I showed in the present circumstances. So that uh, I'm not in favor of bringing out a political meaning. Political meaning can be brought in. Now, for example, the scene of dice. 
So here, of course, the ruler is, uh, I don't know whether it's a ruler, but a nobility is watching. Uh, and so there is some kind of nobles or important person. Uh, but how far it, uh, it had a political uh, inclination or a turn, that I don't know. Yeah, ma there is one another question. Why is representation of drinking scenes on plaques from North India associated with Indo Scythians? Why aren't they why aren't there any drinking scenes belonging to non-Indo Scythians origin on sculptures? Okay. Uh, first, let me tell you, I mentioned indo Scythians because we were talking of Mathura, and Mathura was once ruled by the indo Scythians. And um, uh, there is actually drinking scenes are very much present in Gandhara. If you look at the Gandharan material, and um, I have uh, my ancient India presidential address of the History Congress. If you uh, read uh, that, I have explained this very categorically that in the Northwest, we, I cannot say that drinking was not known in the Indian context or in the North Indian context. No, of course not. We have so much of variety of drinks. We have the difference between Shura and uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the Shoma Rasa. So Shura, and then we have reference to Shura Dhaja. So you have reference to Shundika. So there are so many evidences of this. But my question was, as a social habit, do you find the way we find representation of uh, the a family, like I showed in that article of mine, uh, the father, mother, son, daughter-in-law, and the son together, uh, this is a fem sedate family drinking scene. In that early part, in Indian context, North Indian context, or in general Indian context, do we find such kind of scenes in our repertoire? No, we have evidence of Shura, of course, but we do not find such kind of as a social habit. So this is why, and I, I mentioned Mathura in the context of Mathura indo because indo were Philhellenic. And since they're Philhellenic, they were actually imbibing the, uh, the habits of the Greeks, of the Hellenic people. And so the concept of being drunk by uh, going to the drunken houses and being drunk and all this, uh, largely belong to that, to the Northwest. And so perhaps there was a kind of an indo inference. That is my statement, but uh, I, I don't know the name of the person who has asked. I would request uh, you to please read my History Congress address, uh, the Lavi Quotidian, which is also about, it's about Gandhara mainly. Thank you, ma'am. So we don't have any more questions. So if there are any questions. I, it's been a long, <laughs> people are tired now, oh. let them go home. So we don't have any questions. So I would, yeah. li I would like to, no, we have one more question, ma'am. Yeah. Just like literature. And <laughs> but I think it's an interesting question. Yeah. Just like literature often reproduce certain convention, conventional motives and items uh, rather than realities of life. And so does the reproduction of conventional artists, uh, artistic items in a temple. Do you think the, that representation in terracotta also reproduce certain conventional, uh, conventional themes? For, for instance, in the depiction of the game of dice in front of ro uh, Royal, there is a scene of Mithuna at the corner. Yes. Uh, yeah, uh, of course, some are, some are repetitions because as mentioned also, uh, I'm, I will come to that scene of the, uh, the loving couple, I would rather say, uh, rather than give this appendage of Mithuna. Uh, but uh, like in the monasteries, if you look, certain scenes are very common. Uh, so these are repetitions. So there was a, a kind of, a, uh, maybe there was a kind of a conventional uh, themes that were to be depicted, but at the same time, there were certain themes which you do not find in any other places. So therefore it is convention, of course, there are many of the elements that are conventional. For example, uh, that uh, the use of, I was showing the sickle cutting of the, the harvesting scene. 
So this kind of plaque you find from Chandrakitagar, you find from Tamluk, you find from other places also. That means that uh, there, there was a keen interest in depicting the harvesting scene in the plug. So it was important. If something is important, then these were repeated in sites like Chandragatugal. But in monastic complexes, uh, there were very interesting uh, scenes did, which are very common. But there were certain things which are uncommon also, like the Vikramshila plug which I showed. Uh, in uh, Shalvan Bihar, in Mainamati, or in Paharpur, I, I have scanned all those, but I have not come across a similar scene of a lady holding a mirror as we find in Vikramshila. So there are conventional, but there are also something. And the amorous couple, that's, I'm, that's why I'm saying that this is a dice. It is in the outdoors, people are there. Mm -hmm. So together with while people are enjoy, enjoying, uh, maybe the couple met and they are enjoying themselves in a one corner. So these kind of things are there and we can't go beyond something because we do not know how it was operating, but it's a very interesting question. Thank you, ma'am. So um, I guess uh, now, I guess uh, we should uh, ask Seema ma'am to give her concluding remarks. So ma'am, over to you. Thank you so much for that. We we really enjoyed that. And I'm sure all the students did from all the questions. And, uh, you know, I'm really uh, grateful. I'm really grateful. Because, you know, we find we were, we were getting a sense of the theoretical framework within which you were speaking. And uh, that I think is important for students to understand that this is not coming out of stray uh, pieces of uh, visual evidence, but it is also framed within a, a discourse of how to study Kutodian elements in historical perspectives. Right? And that is uh, you know, what I hope the students will take away from this lecture. Thank you again for agreeing to be here and spending time with us in the seminar. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for, being, for inviting me and Razi and Parul and everyone from the history department, all our friends. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so Thank much, ma'am, for the wonderful. Thank you. It was very, very interesting, actually. Uh, in terms of also privileging the, you know, the vast uh, amount of material that you have, uh, you are bringing together, and privileging them over the inscriptions uh, uh, is is particularly a departure, maybe for yeah. <laughs> for many conven conventional historians. So increasingly, uh, many more of us will be turning towards visual material as uh, important set. As I said, I don't have a training in art history, so I was I'm looking at the themes and I'm wondering that why these are there and like that thing. Very interesting indeed. Thank you, thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you, and thank you so much, ma'am, for the wonderful okay. lecture. So, shall we? Thanks, leave? thanks to all the participants who attended the lecture. So now. We'll see you all on 23rd of February, 2022, with a new lecture on when Alama Prabhu rejected Bhakti by Dr. Manu Deva Devan, IIT Mandi. So thank yes. you. Thank you so much. He has been working on this. It's a wonderful work. Yeah. Thank you. I'll, I'll join yeah. that. Yeah. See you. Bye. 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 Thank you. <laughs>